Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. Well, welcome back to Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and if you were with us yesterday, you heard the mighty testimony of Pastor Jack Hibbs. On today's edition of Family Talk, we're going to hear about Jack's latest book entitled Living in the Days of Deception, and days is spelled D-A-Z-E, How to Discern Truth from Culture's Lies. Pastor Jack Hibbs is the senior and founding pastor of Calvary Chapel Chino Hills in California. He is also the host, founder, and president of the nationally syndicated TV and radio program, Real Life with Jack Hibbs, which reaches millions worldwide every week. Now, today's program was recorded recently at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention in Nashville, Tennessee, so you may hear the excitement of the attendees in the background as you listen. Well, there's so much to get to today. Let's join our own Gary Bauer and our special guest, Pastor Jack Hibbs, right here, right now, on Family Talk. Well, welcome back to Family Talk. I'm Gary Bauer, and we're happy to welcome back our great guest, Pastor Jack Hibbs, today to follow up on our program yesterday and to talk about his great book that just came out and is going gangbusters. Pastor Hibbs, uh, great to have you back today and looking forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, Gary. And when I got into Tennessee the other day, I had a little time to head on over to a place called Franklin. I went to a Civil War battlefield. And according to the tour guide there, 10,000 guys died in a matter of four and a half to five hours. And so I did a Facebook post and I I was just dumbfounded. I did a Facebook post and I just said, what if, what if all those that died here decided to just stay home? They weren't going to get involved. In fact, what if the South just stayed the South and the North stayed the North? What would have become of this nation? What would have become, I said, on social media, our black brothers and sisters would have been still today in slavery if people weren't willing to lay down their lives. They didn't play it safe so others could be free. But what if on this President's Day, it was was Monday, what if they chose not to get involved? They decided to be spectators to what was going on. This nation would be in slavery today. And today, the church needs to wake up But that means the pastors have got to wake up. If God wakes up America's pastors, if they're willing to be truly awakened to what God wants, then I do have hope. I do have a hope like Nineveh got an infusion of hope at the last moment. He did it before Nineveh. Maybe God will do it again right now. We have to pray that uh, that he does. I God can do obviously anything he wants, but I've always felt that if something happened to America, if you know, if there was another plague and it only affected us or some horrific attack that caught us completely by surprise, it, it wouldn't take 50 years if America wasn't around anymore right. or 10 years. Probably in a matter of a year, the world, I believe, would sink into another dark age. Mm-hmm. So even in our damaged state we're in, we still have a, a tremendous influence on the rest of the world and those mm. yearning for freedom and so forth. So let, let's get to your, your book, um, Living in the Days of Deception, How to Discern Truth from Culture's Lies. What led you to write this now? Was it a specific mm. issue you were seeing or uh, a set of issues? By the way, I hear, I haven't looked at the latest figures, but I heard that it pretty quickly shot up to number one on Amazon. We have been blown away. It hit Amazon number one, uh, and then, you know, that's a very dynamic system that they have. But we have been back in Amazon's global. This is all of Amazon. We've been back in in the top 100 category for three different times. Mm. We've been shocked by how many people are getting it. What's the point? They walk by the bookstore and they see the, the this one word, D-A-Z-E. That's what grabs their attention. People feel like they're in a daze. Non-believers atheist and believers alike. They feel like they're in the days. And so during COVID, Gary, I did a sermon series called Living in the Days of Deception. And I addressed various issues that I thought from a biblical worldview were getting it wrong. And one of those things was that the church was told to shut down. 
But those were politicians trying to shut down the church. They may have wanted our best in mind. I get that. But the church has never shut down throughout world history. The church has always stepped up. If it was the bubonic plague in Europe or if it was the cholera epidemic in England, the church rose to meet the needs of the hurting. And so I announced to our governor back then, we're going to be open. We're going to be ministering. And then fast forward, right in the middle of COVID, I, I pivoted and did this series on living in the days of deception. So the wonderful people at Harvest House Publishing, they were watching that series and the president reached out and said, would you uh, like to do a book on this? And I actually said, no. I mean, we were up to our necks in ministry and that was the last thing I needed. And he said, well, can we at least buy the title from you? And I thought, what? So I said, you really mean that this could have some traction? He goes, just the title sells books that title, Living in the Days of Deception, it's now. Wow. And so wrote the book. He loved it. And then then he said, we're not going to publish it right now. And this was his call. It was brilliant. He said, let's hold off about six months because I think that God could use this book during the election year. Let's wait till 2024 to let this go. And I got to tell you, Gary, the chapters of the book, uh, God knew what he was doing because if you read what was written uh, then to what's now happening, it's prophetic, and I didn't even know it. It's timely, and that's to the wisdom of Harvest House Publishers. They did a great work. Man, that that is wisdom because they, usually they want to you know rush out with a book yeah. as soon as it gets done. Uh, but uh, in a year that we're facing right now with uh, the decisions in front of the country, I, I actually think that this could determine you know whether America goes on and falls off the cliff or whether we buy ourselves some time uh, in order to get God's blessing back. You know, you, you've talked uh, about how deception is growing, and that's to be expected, I think, in the purely secular world. But it's happening in the church, too. Could you address that a little bit? Because I'm, I'm seeing pastors and churches endorsing things that they, they must be looking mm-hmm. at some other Bible than I'm looking at. <laughs> I, th- I don't think they're looking at a Bible, Gary. Uh, The things that I I see it as well. They're not looking. They're not reading it. I don't know what their thing is. God will be the judge in the end. But uh, Charles Spurgeon said 200 years ago, watch out for pastors that preach sermonettes for Christianettes. And sadly, that's what we see around our world today. We see a church that is disengaged. We see a church that does a 60-minute service on Sunday and then back to whatever by Sunday afternoon. And I'll, I'll pick up God again next week. Uh, outside of that, you know, uh, it's my world. And that doesn't work. And that's not who Jesus is. And so what we would love to see happen is for pastors to trust God, be fearless in the pulpit, speak to the issues that their congregants have got to deal with, Gary, every day at work. They've got to deal with the issues of the border, of of sin or abortion or war, all of these things. The Bible has the answer for everything. I kind of believe that life is kind of rigged, meaning this way, that whatever happens in life, the Bible's got the answer for it. We just need to open it up and read it. Uh, it seems pretty clear to me that with all of the problems America has, racial reconciliation, rebuilding the family, fighting corruption or, or whatever, it is impossible to solve any of those problems without the active involvement of the men and women of Christ who can bring mm-hmm. those biblical values into the public debate. And if we don't do that, then we have really uh, not only betrayed our founding fathers, I think, but ultimately we'll condemn mm-hmm. our own children and grandchildren to lesser lives. Well, leave it to you to be so articulate in that comment. You're exactly correct. And, you know, you said something a second ago that made me uh, remember our first Supreme Court Chief Justice was a man by the name of John Jay, signer of the Declaration of Independence and some of our other documents. John Jay, listen to this. He said something that, can you imagine this being said today? John Jay said, it is incumbent upon this nation to put forth Christians and to vote for Christians to hold office because they fear God. Wow. I mean, think about that being said today. What if that was said today on on some news program? They would lock the guy up. You know, that's just something that is unacceptable. And yet, that's God's path back. We need to turn back to him. 
So here's where I'm at right now in my own life. And I'm living in Southern California. We're dealing with a lot of this stuff where God told Israel in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28, he said, I'm going to, if you follow me, just follow me. Your women will give birth to children. There'll be no miscarriages. Your crops will explode in abundance. Nations will come to Israel to borrow money. You will never have to borrow. You will loan them money. I will protect your borders and I will bring peace to your land and I'll put the fear of me in the hearts of your enemy. But if you refuse to walk with me, your women will miscarry. Your fields will fail and you get where I'm going. He repeats himself backwards in the negative that all of these things will befall you if you forsake me. And you said it. America is at this moment of which direction are we going to go? But notice, if I understand my Bible right, he's not asking Barack Obama or Joe Biden. He's not asking you name it. He's not asking them. He says, if my people who are called by my name would repent of their sins, seek his face. He wants his people to intercede for America or any nation you may be listening from right now. We hold the key to the continuance of America by simply praying and crying out to him for mercy and forgiveness. Yeah, you know, the times when the church has failed at that, um, we look back on it and we're kind of ashamed, as we should be. I mean, a lot of the churches in the South during this civil rights movement mm-hmm. uh, were, were AWOL. They, they, uh, they didn't mm-hmm. want to get involved. They, you know, it, it might offend somebody in the congregation. And then we look at the Christian church in Germany in the 30s, and Eric Metaxas wrote an incredible book about that. How could they be so blind or so cowardly right. that they wouldn't stand up? And it seems like we're in danger of being in the same position today, in, in, unless we can get a whole lot of people to read your book because you you address these issues. So in the book, you talk about something called easy believism and, and that that is actually an enemy of the cross. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. yeah, it's actually a form of spiritual inoculation against the truth. If the same word out of the mouth of Jesus was the same out of the mouth of Peter and Paul and all of the apostles and all of the church fathers, if they all said the same thing, what was it that they said? It was the gospel. Today, very few people know what the gospel is. Oh, no, Jesus died for my sins on the cross. Yes, that's true. But the gospel is repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. The word repent is an ancient nautical term meaning turn 180 degrees around. Metanoia. Here's the thing. We have churches today that will never bring up, Gary, the word repent. They'll never mention the word sin. So Jesus is this add-on. I have a Costco card. I've got a AAA membership. And I got my Jesus card. I'm covered. I'm good. Never stopping to think that God is literally a person, a personality. That's why we are persons and we have personality. We've been created in his image. We can have experience and dialogue and we can create and we can have friendships and we can... Why? Because we're creating his image. And yet we rob him of having that same opportunity all the while we're in church. We're in church. Just keep God in the box. He, he Listen, he got out of the box a long time ago. He's not <laughs> in the Ark of the Covenant anymore. He wants to live inside of us. Again, it's incumbent upon pastors to preach the full counsel of God. And easy believism is just believe and you'll be saved. That sounds great, but that's not the truth. I was reminded at Mount Vernon. I love George Washington. Yes. And I believe, I believe in George Washington, but my faith is not in George Washington for my citizenship. Does that make sense? I'm an American, but I don't put my faith in him to have a passport. I believe in him. A lot of people believe in Jesus, but they don't put their faith in him to live their lives. Mm. Here's my question to America today. You say you believe in Jesus, but has your belief taken you to faith? Is your life active for God? No matter, you can be at MIT or you could be at USC. I don't care where you're at. Does your life reflect the fact that God is in control of your life? Because we want to be careful. Easy believism is very dangerous. You want your belief to bring you to faith. There's a big difference in this. And um, I think that faith is probably the most valuable thing we have. And the object, the reason why the object makes the faith valuable It's Jesus Christ, resurrected Lord and Savior. Well said. 
we're bedeviled by the tolerance issue, and I think you you touch on that too. Uh, the Bible tells us there are only two sexes, male and female. Mm-hmm. How in the world, Pastor, did we get to 70 genders? I mean, and the number keeps growing. You know, it, there, there's more genders than book sales in some cases. So <laughs> what what yeah. is going on? And we're supposed to tolerate all this. Yeah. The, the Secretary of State just a, f- a few weeks ago put out a memo telling the 77,000 employees that work at the State Department what pronouns they needed to use when they're addressing each other. It's like we're living in a bad episode of a, of a science fiction movie or mm. something. Listen, the book of Isaiah warned that in the last days, good would be called evil, evil would be called good, dark would be called light, light would be called dark, and it just goes on and on. We're living at a time right now that because as a nation we have forsaken God— I think it's Norman Geisler who said that when we forsake God, God is no longer in our thinking. And when God is no longer in our thinking, the danger is every man does what's right in his own eyes. Humanism. Mm. So we're watching that play out right now. We're looking at a a Christless culture. We're seeing people making things up and no one, there's few adults in the room saying, wait a minute, we're not going to do that because that could hurt you. In fact, we want to love on you and help you. Instead of actually expressing love and getting rolling up your sleeves and getting involved in someone's life that may be confused or many people who are confused have been either molested or exposed to extreme porn when they were young and it damaged them terribly. We need to love them. We need to help them. But for everybody to just say, yeah, that's good. 70 genders. How about 71? It is just absolutely lunacy. And when I say lunacy, I'm not trying to be mean, but can you imagine being a physician or maybe a first responder and you roll up to a scene and you're trying to treat an individual who might be a male? So you need to medically treat them differently than you would a female, but they're identifying as a giraffe and you're going to be held liable for how you deal with that person. Why? It's the logic is gone. Reason is gone. And um, we need God very badly. But Pastor, you got I mean, you have a huge church, and you come into contact with so many people. Are you getting any pushback or pressure within the church, and how, how do you handle that? Yeah, no, believe it or not, Gary, I don't get pushback in the church. I get mm-hmm. pushback from those that are around the church. It's interesting that when I do lay it out like that, which is quite often— They hear the truth, but they know it's coming to them in love. I had somebody come up to me and say, you know what? You're really hard to hate. (laughs) I thought that was great. I said, what do you mean by that? He goes, I don't like what you're saying. Okay. I don't like what you're saying, but you're really hard to hate because I I hear it said in love. It's true. So someone's got to tell somebody the truth if you love them. I thank God my doctor doesn't tell me what I want to feel. My doctor tells me we're going to cut that out. We're going to get a knife right now because I'm going to save your life. And um, I think that we need to just do what we do in love. Think about it. Jesus was the most loved individual the world has ever seen, the most loving and the most loved by those he came in contact with, at the same time the most hated, so much so that nobody drops a hammer on their foot or a brick and shouts Mohammed Mm. when they cuss. They shout Jesus Christ when they cuss. Isn't that interesting? All around the world, they use the name Jesus Christ when they want to cuss. Nobody yells Buddha. They always yell Jesus. Why? Jesus Christ is resurrected Lord and Savior. He's what it's all about. We need to tell people the truth. We love them. We owe them the truth. And Christ would tell them the truth. What a great point. Pastor, we're we're, uh, sadly getting to the end of our conversation, but... uh, Christians debate this and pray about it and so forth, about are we in the end times or whatever. I think you might be inclined to believe we are, but no man knows the time. So even if we are, correct, what does that require us to do? It certainly doesn't require us to just sit around Mm -hmm. and wait, correct? (laughs) Oh, you are so correct. In fact, how about this? Um, I'm a big fan of C.S. Lewis. He said it really good. He said that I have, I have learned that those who expect to see heaven uh, soon are those who get the most done here in the now. And I like that. Look, I believe Jesus could come for my life today. And if that's true, then I want to get as much done for him as possible. So 
because I am one who believes that these are the last days, I'm trying, and I don't know the day, nobody does, but it could be next week, it could be 100 years from now. So I'm working hard right now for my grandkids. I'm standing for my country. I'm standing for freedoms. I'm standing for the rights of others because I'm occupying till I come. Jesus is occupied till I come. And that's what I'm doing. I'm going to be engaged. I'm going to encourage people to, to get engaged because, yes, Christ is coming back, but we don't know when. So in the meantime, let's do what he wants us to do. And then if he does come back, let's get let's let's get caught doing what he told us to do when he comes. Wow. Well, Pastor, uh, this has been wonderful. Uh, I, I enjoyed the interview. You're, you're speaking a lot of truth at a time when a hurting country really needs to hear it. Uh, we, we love our partnership with you at JDFI and all the times we work together and look forward to doing that more yes. in the future. Pastor, can I impose on you to, to close the program with a prayer? Thank you, Gary, so much. Father, we just lift up this nation. No other nation in the history of man has experienced what you have given us. We pray that you would revisit, Lord, that you would hear again the, those covenant prayers of our pilgrim fathers, that you'd remember the passion and the debate before they even stepped off the Mayflower. Two paragraphs honoring you and mentioning you and, and giving this continent to you. Father, we pray that you remember the prayers of Washington that would pray. And Lord, so many of our founding fathers. And Lord, we ask of you that though we have offended you in so many ways as a people, as a nation, we ask you to send forgiveness. We pray that you send repentance to our hearts. And God, that so many people would realize right now, God loves them. Jesus died on the cross for them to experience the forgiveness of sins and a life with you in heaven forever. And so, Lord God, I ask you to bless Gary. Thank you, Lord, for Dr. Dobson and Shirley and all that this awesome, wonderful organization continues to do. I pray that you'd advance them more than ever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, what a powerful prayer indeed. Listening to those words, I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Well, we certainly must be prepared for when the Lord returns, as we do not know the day or the hour. But friend, this was the conclusion of a special two-part conversation featuring Gary Bauer and Pastor Jack Hibbs here on Family Talk. I really encourage you to listen again if you missed any part of this encouraging and insightful conversation. And remember, you can do so easily simply by visiting our website at drjamesdobson.org forward slash Family Talk. As we've just celebrated the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, perhaps now's a good time to take some time to reflect on the areas of your life that might need a bit of spring cleaning. Here at the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute, we are always here to provide a number of resources to you, many of them available without cost. We'll also be here to listen and pray with and for you. If you'd like to reach out today right now, you can call our customer care team at 877-732-6825. That's 877-732-6825. Or you can reach out to us online by visiting drjamesdobson.org. Well, I'm Roger Marsh, praying that God continues to bless you and your family as you grow deeper in your relationship with Him. And thanks so much for joining us today for another edition of Family Talk, the voice you trust for the family you love. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Hello, everyone. This is James Dobson inviting you to join us for our next edition of Family Talk. Every day we come to these microphones with someone in mind, whether it's a busy mom looking for tips on discipline or a husband who wants to learn more about connecting with his wife. We want to put an arm around your family in any way that we can. So join us next time for Family Talk, won't you? 
For over 40 years, Dr. James Dobson has been working to support the institution of the family. During that time, he's authored over 50 books, written hundreds of articles, broadcast thousands of radio shows, and produced many videos and films. Over the past few years, we've been busy digitizing and organizing Dr. Dobson's entire life's work to create a comprehensive library. And now you can personalize the Dobson Digital Library as your own. Getting started is easy. Want to find out ways to encourage your strong-willed child? Or perhaps you want to add some more romance into your marriage? Simply tap into the search bar. Thousands of related articles, broadcasts, books, and videos are at your fingertips. Want even more? You can save your favorite resources to your personal library by creating an account. We even give you the ability to save resources to view later. Like what you find? We make it easy to share with those you care about. It's as simple as that. Search, save, and share. With the Dobson Digital Library, thousands of resources on parenting, marriage, faith, and culture are at your fingertips. Getting started is only one click away.